أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصص السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ما بعد We are still doing the story of Adam عليه السلام and we are now winding down we're getting to the end of the story that we know it from the Quran and Sunnah and we have some uh, miscellaneous topics to do towards the end and I want to begin today by uh, going back to a passage in Surah Al-A'raf as we mentioned, the Quran mentions the story of Adam more than half a dozen times. And one of the most detailed stories uh, or, or times it is mentioned is in the first pages of Surah Al-A'raf, to be uh, specific, you know, verse uh, 15 onwards. And in this section, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala links the story of Adam with something that it is not linked to in any other part of the Quran. So Surah Al-A'raf mentions the concept of modesty and haya and covering an awra and contrast this with shaitan's attempt to bring about indecency, fahsha, nakedness and nudity. So this is something that is quite interesting and it is only in Surah Al-A'raf. So let us go over the verses and let us derive some benefits from uh, this series of verses. We begin with verse number 20. The story begins earlier, but we are interested in this particular section. I've done the previous uh, section in previous lectures. فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِمُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانِ That shaytan tempted them, uh, that, uh, that uh, shaytan tempted them, لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنْ سَوْآتِهِمَا That in order to expose what was hidden of their nakedness. So shaytan tempted them with an intention in mind. Shaytan had a goal in mind. What was the goal of Shaytan? The goal of Shaytan, the agenda of Shaytan from the very beginning was لِيُبْدِيَ He wanted to expose to them what was hidden of their nakedness. Shaytan wants us to discard the fine garments that Allah has blessed us with. It is of the explicit goals, dare I say, it was the first tactic of shaitan, subhanAllah, that he wanted this goal. But with our mother and father Adam, he didn't start by mentioning the goal, it was in his mind. He started by seducing them with long life. But he knew that the first result of that sin would be to expose what was hidden of their nakedness. And he said, your Lord has only forbidden this tree in order to prevent you from becoming angels or immortals. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا And he swore to them, إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ I am truly your sincere advisor. He brought about their fall through deception. When they ate of the tree, their nakedness was exposed to them. And their nakedness was exposed to them. And they began covering themselves with the leaves of paradise. And Allah called out to them, Alam an hakuma, didn't I forbid the both of you from eating of the tree? And didn't I tell you that shaitan was your uh, sworn enemy? Then Allah says, Descend enemies unto one another. You will find in this earth a temporary residence and a provision for the time being. On this earth, fiha tahyona, wa fiha tamutuna, wa minha tukhrajun. You will live here, you will die here, you will be resurrected from here. After Allah Azza wa Jal then says, Ya bani Adam, O children of Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasa. We have provided for you, or sent down for you, or reveal for you clothing. We have revealed for you clothing in order to cover your nakedness. In order to cover your nakedness, warisha, and as an adornment and beauty, waribasu taqwa dalika khair, and the guard, the, the clothing of piety is better, and this is of the bounties of Allah, 
so that you may be mindful of Allah. Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, la yaftinannakum shaytan Make sure shaytan does not deceive you. Kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah. As he deceived and tempted your parents out of paradise, and he caused their cover to be removed in order to expose their nakedness. So Allah is reminding us, O children of Adam, do not allow shaytan to do unto you as he did to your parents. Do not be deceived by shaytan to go down the path of immorality, the path of nudity, the path of fahsha, like your parents were taken down this path unwittingly. Unfortunately, we are being taken down this path wittingly. Shaitan tells us directly, our mother and father were too pious and too holy that they would have been tempted by this. They were tempted by something else. They were tempted by long life, by immortality. And when they went down that path, what happened, happened. In our generation, there, there is no temptation of immor immortality. It is directly, shaitan is wanting fahsha immediately. And shaitan is telling us to be indecent. And the bulk of mankind have followed shaitan in this. And Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً When they commit a shameful deed, قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا آبَاءَنَا وَاللَّهُ أَمَرَنَا بِهَا They say, we found our forefathers doing this, and Allah has commanded us to do this deed. قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءَ Respond, Allah never commands indecency. أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Do you ascribe to Allah that which you do not know out of your ignorance? Now, I have gone over this passage quickly. Time is always limited in our lectures. I want you to open up the Qur'an after this lecture is over, or even pause here and read this entire passage. Surat Al-A'raf, verses 20 to 28. Read this entire passage. The entire narrative is linked to haya, to modesty. Our Prophet ﷺ said, every religion has a defining characteristic. And the defining characteristic of our religion is, is, is haya. It is modesty, it is haya. Every religion has a defining characteristic. And the single defining characteristic of our religion, it is modesty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our mother and father and He clothed them in Jannah. Now, what were they clothed with? What were they wearing? Well, some scholars have said that they were uh, wearing the clothes of Jannah. And others have said that Allah clothed them with a special light so that the light blinded their aura from one another. And so when they were in public, that light would be uh, you know, around them. And yet others have some you know, bizarre opinions. By the way, there's also opinions you should be aware of that. We find these in the books, you know, in the early books that there is an opinion that Adam and Hawa had a special type of skin, maybe like an animal skin, or maybe like you know, nail type of stuff or some type of adornment. And that when they committed the sin, that special skin was taken away. So we are the only species that doesn't have a special fur or a special skin or a special outer layer. This is, you find it in the books. In all likelihood, what really makes the most sense and Allah knows best, is that they were wearing the clothes of Jannah. Or even if we were to say, they had a special light emanating from them, they were in Jannah. And so they are covered and clothed and dignified and made decent by a special clothing or a special light. And when they ate of the tree, when they ate of the tree, then that special clothing or that special light was stripped away from them. And so they then were naked. They didn't have anything. By, by the way, contrast this to the Bible. Remember we talked about this multiple times where in the Bible it is portrayed that that was the tree of knowledge. They shouldn't have had any knowledge. And so they didn't know anything. And then that taught them. So it is as if, you know, they're being told don't learn anything. That's not our narrative. Our narrative is that they had knowledge and they were knowledgeable, but they committed a sin. And what that sin does was that it stripped away Allah's blessings. It took away a blessing from Allah. We seek Allah's refuge, we seek Allah's um, forgiveness, we ask Allah to protect us and afiyah, uh, we ask Allah for His maghfir and afiyah, but it is very terrifying brothers and sisters that our own sins can strip away uh, what Allah has blessed us with. And we seek Allah's maghfirah, uh, if only, يعني, if, if it were not for Allah's maghfirah and Allah's satr and Allah's rahmah, then subhanAllah, all of our blessings would be taken away. So we ask Allah for afiyah, but this is a 
terrifying reality as well, that by disobeying Allah, a blessing that they had was taken away from them. So when they ate from the tree, either that light disappeared or the clothes of Jannah were taken off. And this was the direct result of disobeying Allah and it was the explicit intention of shaitan. Shaitan knew because shaitan had longer time in Jannah. As you know, we had talked about this. Iblis was alive for eons, millennia. We, know, we don't know how long. Many, many, many you know, lifetimes before Adam and Hawa. And Iblis knew things and he knew that if they disobeyed, then they would be stripped naked. And he wanted that to happen. So Allah says, لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنْ سَوْأَتِهِمَا Iblis wanted to expose their nakedness that had been covered up. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when it was taken away, طَفِقَا يَخْصِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ They felt shamed, ashamed. They felt embarrassed which, because this is the reality of Iman the reality of haya, the reality of decency, you cover yourself. Even a child knows this. Even a toddler, some young boy or girl, they know they should not just be walking around without clothes. It's ingrained in their fitra. Only a baby, a baby is a baby. Once you get to an age of discernment, once you understand even a young man or woman, they don't, they should not be even doing this. And they want to cover and they feel a sense of awkwardness and a sense of yani, lack of haya, a sense of shamelessness. That uh, it does not occur from a heart that has an ounce of iman, that they do not walk around in this manner. And so when our mother and father found themselves in that state, automatically they took the leaves. They took the leaves and they covered themselves, even though they are in Jannah. And they're not even in front of other human beings. There are no human beings. There are no human beings. Still, there is a notion of not being like this in public, in the gardens of Jannah. And so they cover themselves up. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right after mentioning this verse, Right after talking about this, Allah says, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam. After telling us the story of Adam and Hawa, O children of Adam, Qad anzalna alaykum libasa. We have revealed the same word that is used for revealing revelation, revealing the rain, revealing Allah's blessings, anzala, to send down. The same word, it is divine, the origin of clothing. It goes back to Allah having ingrained in us that we should be clothed. And it goes back to the origin of, of our mother and father being clothed. And so Allah says, anzalna alaykum libas. Now our scholars try to make sense of what does it mean, anzalna alaykum libas. And some say that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that sends down the blessings that we then use to make our clothes. And this is an interpretation. So, you know, the furs and the skins and the, uh, uh, and the, the, the cloth of the material, the trees, where does it come from? These are blessings from Allah. And these blessings, they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is also an opinion, and this is, it's mentioned, yani Allah knows how true it is. It is mentioned that when our mother and father came down, they were actually uh, uh, clothed. So after they were expelled from Jannah, they were clothed and they came down to this earth uh, clothed. This is, again, it could be interpreted in this manner, anzalna alaykum libasa, that the clothes came down as well. And some say that they came down without clothing and they uh, 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 made clothing over here. We would there are no eyewitnesses, so we will never uh, know this reality. The point being, the word that is used, the verb that is used, indicates that clothes in and of themselves are a blessing from Allah, and they are the default characteristic of mankind. That our mother and father were clothed, and Allah wants us to be clothed. So Allah says, anzalna alaykum libasan. He, he revealed to you clothes. And we said both the desire to wear clothes and the blessings of clothes, they come from Allah. So the desire to be clothed is from Allah. And what we use to make cloth is from, or what we use to clothe ourselves is from Allah. Why do we have clothes? Allah says in the Quran, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَ عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَاهْرِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا To cover your nakedness and as a means of decoration, to cover your nakedness and as a means of decoration. So two reasons are given. Number one, to cover our awrah, our sawat, our private parts. 
Every person has an area of the body, right? It is our private parts. We don't show. And the Sharia has defined what it is. For the man, it is between the navel and the knee in public. And for the woman, it is her entire body, except for her face and hands. This is the awrah. And in particular of the awrah, there are the private parts. And this is especially more uh, uh, important to protect. And that is why Allah says, we have revealed clothes, yuwari so'atikum, to protect and cover your nakedness. And also there's another reason given, warisha. And risha here, it means to be decorated, to look good, to look beautiful. So there is a modesty issue, and there is a beauty issue. And Allah says the both of them are fulfilled by clothes. So clothes, first and foremost, they cover our haya, our, our modesty. And secondly, we feel full and complete. We feel, you know, some, uh, we feel a sense of yani, uh, looking good and that's natural. Remember the famous hadith of the man who came and said, O Messenger of Allah, we all like to have good clothes and good shoes. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Allah loves beauty, beauty, and He Himself is beauty. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to look dignified and good, obviously with parameters, they must be within the Sharia and not flaunting, etc., etc. Point being, Allah explicitly links the story of Adam to the concept of haya and modesty, and Allah uses the story of Adam to warn us against immodesty and against nakedness and nudity. And therefore, anybody who openly encourages nakedness, who embraces a lifestyle of flaunting one's body, is literally following the footsteps and the goal and the desire of shaitan against our own mother and father. And it is sad to point out that these days we have entire movements dedicated to this notion of you know embracing how you know God created us in our natural clothing or whatnot. But we say, no, the natural default Anzalna alaykum. Allah created within us the desire to be clothed. And Allah blessed us with material to clothe ourselves. So the natural state is to want to be clothed when you are an adult. Yes, a baby is born. Yes, the way it is born. But that is not the natural state of an adult. The natural state of an adult is mentioned quite explicitly over here. And this was the state of our own parents, that they were dressed and they were clothed, even in the garden of Jannah. And we also are told of another incident in Mecca. It's directly linked in, th in these verses. وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً When they do a lewd and indecent deed. What is this a reference to? It is a reference to a pagan custom. And Allah brings it in, in the context of the story of Adam, even though they did not use the story of Adam. But Allah brings it in because anything to do with nakedness and nudity and fahsha, in this manner, it can be used in the story of Adam and Hawa because Iblis wanted this to happen. So what is this custom of the Quraysh? It is mentioned in our books of Seerah and the books of Tafsir that the Quraysh had a very, very evil and vulgar and indecent practice, or some people of them. And not just the Quraysh, by the way, I said Quraysh here, I should say the Jahili Arabs. They had a very indecent practice. And when I say this to Muslims, they are shocked. They cannot believe that this was the case, but it is the Quran references it. And that is that some people, not all, it wasn't like the default, but it was not uncommon either as an act of piety, they would come to Mecca for Hajj and Umrah, and they would become naked in front of the Kaaba. And they would do tawaf wearing nothing. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, disgusting. And shaitan gave them a bizarre excuse, very similar to the excuse of the modern nudist movements, the modern fahsha movements. This is our natural state. Why should we hide between us and God? What is there to hide between us and God? You are not hiding between you and God. This is modesty to cover yourself in front of other human beings. It's not a matter of hiding. And by the way, if you wanted to bring this tactic or this argument, we have it in the hadith of Bahaz ibn Hakim from his father, from his grandfather. When he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, if I'm all alone, can I just walk around with no clothes? And the Prophet said, 
Allahu ahaqqu an yustahya minhu. It is more befitting that you have haya of Allah than you have haya of other people. In other words, just be modest even in your private life. But the point being, these pre-Islamic jahili Arabs, they would do tawaf wearing nothing. As I said, please understand, this wasn't the norm or the default. Not everybody did it. But once in a while, somebody wanted to show that they're super pious. And how would they show they're super pious? Man and women. They would take off their garments in public. And they would say, we are now going to expose ourselves to Allah directly. How can we hide from Allah? And you know, if it was a lady, she would put her hands on her sensitive parts, you know, one hand in one hand, she would uh, do that and she would versify that. Today, you know, this much has been, uh, you know, uncovered or covered and later on or, uh, uh, it will be uh, fully uncovered. So she, they had some, you know, vulgar poetry as well in this regard. The point being that they would do this act. And when they were asked, how could you do tawaf naked? They would say two things. وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا أَبَاءَنَا وَاللَّهُ أَمَرَنَا بِهَا We found our forefathers doing this. And Allah has commanded us to do this. So they gave two excuses. And Allah Azza wa Jal remained silent about the first because they did find a few generations of people doing this. But He refuted the second. قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءَ Say Allah does not command to fahsha. Are you accusing Allah of that which you do not know? So Allah resoundingly refuted this ridiculous excuse of the pre-Islamic Arabs that Allah has commanded us to do tawaf naked. No, Allah did not command this. And anybody who commands others to take off their clothes, their hijab, to take off what Allah has blessed them with, they are following the tactics of shaitan and they should never use the name of Allah. Allah does not command fahsha. This is very explicit in the Quran. And of course, I mean, you know, I, I wish we could go into more details, but I mean, the, the, the topic here is the story of Adam and Hawa. But subhanAllah, you know, we live in a time in a place where never in human history has there been such an emphasis on uh, nakedness and on nudity and on the proliferation of pornography. We seek Allah's refuge, we seek Allah's forgiveness. How much have our eyes seen and how much has society just broadcast everywhere? And the, the, the problems of nudity, the problems of fahsha are well known and documented. And in reality, more and more psychiatrists and sociologists and researchers of no faith background more and more analysts and scientists are telling us of the dangers of this disease of nakedness and pornography, this disease of the proliferation of the human body without its covering and of everywhere you see, we see these types of, 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 of images that are not befitting human dignity and are clearly a tactic of shaitan. We know for a fact, and this is now verified that Pornography in particular has so many problems. Of them is the addiction, you know, the dopamine effect that takes place. The mind becomes numb. The addiction to pornography, according to some reports, is typically even worse than the addiction to some types of drugs. The mind becomes addicted and it is very, very, very difficult to break away from the addict in this in this regard. And this fahsha and this nudity, this constant uh, bombardment of these images, it breaks up marriages and relationships, subhanAllah. I mean, I don't want to go down this tangent. This is the story of Adam and Hawa. But as a person of, you know, uh, community leadership and Imam and Sheikh role, I get bombarded with sisters emailing me that they have discovered their husbands watching this and doing this. And because of this, they're not being a proper husband or they're not fulfilling what is needed or they're not even interested in, 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 in marriage to their wives. A'udhu Billah, how many marriages are falling apart because of this disease that shaitan wanted us to do. And Allah links it to the story of Adam and Allah mentions the incident of the Quraysh and links it to the story of Adam. So we as well can link this issue of pornography and this issue of fahsha directly to the tactic of Adam back then. Shaitan wants us to 
go down this path. And people don't understand, uh, especially uh, young men, and maybe many of our sisters don't understand that the problem of this type of genre of material, it is damaging to the psyche of many, many people. You see, once upon a time, you know, believe it or not, to, to, uh, to, for a young man to want to be married and to have a family, it was a huge motivational force for him to study hard, get a career, get a job, get his act together, live a dignified life so that he can be presentable to a lady, get married to this lady, have children. Now, fahsha has become prevalent. There is no need for marriage anymore. Not just the hookup culture, but a'udhu billah, the fahsha indecency culture, which shaitan is definitely aiming for. It has caused men 30 year old, يعني, no job, no career, living with their parents, playing games all day. This is a problem that threatens our entire societies, not just the Muslims, it threatens the productivity of humanity. So much of the people's time, so much of the bandwidth of the internet is being used for fahsha. The productivity, even if a person doesn't believe in God, a'udhu billah from that, even if a person doesn't believe in God, scientists and psychiatrists are saying this is a problem that is destroying the productivity of mankind. It is destroying marriages and relationships. It is increasing crimes, sexual crimes. It is increasing molestations and rape and the, 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 de the, the demeaning of, 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 the, of the female uh, body and persona. It is harming human relationships. And all of this is breaking up in front of us. And this is a silent disease that every household billah, or almost every household is afflicted with and yet we turn the other way as if nothing is going on. Subhanallah, we live in a time and a place where never before has fahsha been as proliferated and as freely available as it is now. And studies are being done. And just listen to some TED Talks, just listen to some TED Talks in this regard or other you know, academic papers on this. There are many Christian and Muslim and Jewish institutes that are talking about the dangers of this uh, uh, demeaning uh, genre of uh, you know uh, how women are portrayed and the nudity and whatnot and it is truly dangerous to society and it is dangerous to faith and it is dangerous to all of humanity and all of this we are told in the Quran is a direct tactic of shaitan it's exactly what shaitan wanted so muslims la yaftinannakumu shaitan let not shaitan tempt you. This is in the Quran. Kama akhra, akhra jannah. Like he caused your parents to be expelled from Jannah. Notice how Allah links this with our own parents. Allah literally links this problem and says, don't do what your parents fell into. Now, again, to be clear, our parents fell into it for, for a different reason. Our parents were not tempted by a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, the fahsha. They were tempted by something that at least is, is yani not as blatantly evil as fahsha. They wanted immortality. But shaitan knew that this would be a repercussion of that. And Allah is telling us, now shaitan is going to tempt you directly. He took their clothes off so that their nakedness was available or free for everybody to see. And Allah says, لا يفتننكم. And here we are, we are getting under the fitna and we are falling prey to shaitan and we're listening to shaitan. So dear Muslims, dear brothers, dear sisters in particular, Guard your modesty, guard your chastity. Don't open the doors of this fahsha. Don't be deceived by shaitan. Wallahi, this is not your empowerment. This is not your liberation. Your true liberation is in embracing your femininity and it is in guarding what Allah has guarded and it is in protecting what Allah has protected and it is in that modesty, that virtue of modesty that is the, the quintessential virtue of our faith tradition. It is so sad, Wallahi, it is so sad to see Muslim lands, to see lands that used to be beacons of you know Islam and Tawheed and whatnot. They used to be preaching 
teaching the correct, يعني, you know, uh, at least society-wise, they were upon such good. And now they have opened their doors to fahsha. They've opened their doors to public يعني, nudity and public things of this nature. Wallahi, it is so, so distressing and it hurts the heart and it feels that we are now living towards the very end of times. And yet we have on the other side so many people mocking our uh, uh, disgust and our hurt. And they say, look at these backward people. They can't take a little bit of nudity. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. This is the essence of shaitan's trap. It's not a little bit of nudity. It destroys the fabric of society. It destroys the sanity. It destroys morality and iman and taqwa. And it's not just me who is saying this. As I have said, so many studies have shown the dangers of public nudity and of pornography and of opening of the door of fahsha. When we limit this type of stuff and we only allow intimacy within marriage and we make sure that society wise, you know, what happens behind closed doors, subhanAllah, yani, since the beginning of time, sins have taken place in private and no doubt that is bad. But to take place in private, that is a personal sin between the people who are doing it. But when sins become public, when sins become fahsha, becomes in the streets, that is the real danger. What happens behind closed doors? Even in prophetic Medina, we know that people, you know, drank and people committed zina. It's in the hadith, it, it's gonna happen. But what happens behind closed doors, it is at least not going to affect the public. But the problem comes as this, these verses mention, لَهُمَا It becomes now all public and this is going to bring about an entire calamity. So brothers and sisters, this issue of fahsha and of modesty, this uh, versus modesty, this issue of covering one's awrah versus displaying the awrah, it is actually linked directly to the fall of Adam. It is as if Allah is saying, dear brothers and sisters, that opening this door, just like our mother and father fell to this earth and it was the cause of their expulsion, the opening of this door is the expulsion of humanity. That's the beginning of the end. That's it. When you open this door, then khalas, there is no coming back. And I swear to you again, if you just look at the last 30, 40 years, you know, I mean, I don't want to get personal. When I was growing up in the 70s, 80s, you know, what we would see on television and the, the programs there, yani compared to 100, of, you know, before that it was definitely not the same. But when you compare 1980s to what our children are seeing, you literally think that that must have been like yani a, a pure era without any fahsha, even though, when we watched it back then, our parents would get irritated at us and they would be, what is going on? How are these jokes happening and whatnot? And what, you know, maybe some indecent clothing for that time frame. When you compare that time frame to now, you think that that is like, you know, 100% halal, even though it's not halal. But I'm just saying, you think there's nothing wrong with that. Now you see the reality of what our children are watching, what even is mainstream entertainment. And you see there is no coming back. And then you see the reality of everything being changed, marriage, being changed, gender being changed, gender roles being changed. And you wonder where did it come from? Literally, it begins with fahsha. It begins with nudity. Once you open this door, there is no coming back. Literally, that's why Allah links it to the fall of Adam and Hawa. Like literally, that's it. Once you open it, and it appears we have already opened it in this society, we seek Allah's refuge. What is to be done other than protect ourselves as much as we can. Fattaqullaha mastata'atum. We seek Allah's refuge. In any case, I went into a bit of a tangent because honestly, um, it, it really deserves it, the time and place we live in. And, and by the way, it's not just in America, everywhere in the Muslim world, everywhere in the world, the internet has made the entire globe open to this reality. Wal'ayyadu billah. And so much can be said, but not only is time limited, but this is not the, 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 the series to go into this detail, but I needed to go into a little bit of a tangent because the Quran goes into it. Literally think about it. I want you to think about this. The story of Adam and Hawa, then Allah brings up the issue of the tawaf of the Quraysh. What has the tawaf of the Quraysh got to do with Adam and Hawa? Allah links it directly. La yaftinannakum. It's the same idea. It's gonna be shaitan wanting to cause you to go down this path. We seek Allah's refuge and afia. In any case, so that is one aspect and that is, uh, the, 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 incident, the, the issue of indecency and the issue of modesty being linked to the story of Adam.
Another uh, miscellaneous, and he's just tying up the loose ends over here, uh, is that completely uh, separate from this, we move on now to another topic, and that is that, uh, what do we know about uh, the children of Adam, and in particular, the issue of marriages between the children? Because obviously, one of the conundrums that everybody asks about all the time, if Adam and Hawa were the origins of all of mankind, and they were, and if they had children and there were no other human beings, well then, how did those children have children? And obviously the issue arises, they're all brothers and sisters, how can they get married and have children? So we have nothing in the Quran or Sunnah that explicitly mentions this uh, reality. However, we have multiple reports from the Sahaba and from the early scholars of Islam. And this is something that is recorded by our historians, Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari and others, they mention this, but it is not Quran and Sunnah. It is the cumulative stories of our early uh, scholars that say, so this is just, a, a, a statement or a, a, you know legendary, but there's nothing wrong with uh, with stating this. And 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 in, in, in all likelihood, this is probably exactly what happened because there is no other alternative. That says that every time our mother Hawa would uh, give birth, every time our mother Hawa would give birth, that she would in fact give birth to twins. She would in fact give birth to twins, and uh, these twins would be haram, a male and female. There would always be a girl and boy born together. And these two would be haram for each other. They would be brother and sister. And the next batch would come and there will be another boy and girl. And this boy and girl would not be haram for the previous. So the first boy would marry the batch of the second girl and the second batch boy would marry the girl of the first batch so that that would be different. Now, this is what has been uh, mentioned. Uh, Al-Tabari, for example, in his tafsir, uh, he mentions that it is reported from a suddi uh, that he mentions from Abu Malik and from Abu Salih, from Ibn Abbas and from Ibn Mas'ud and from a number of Sahaba. An unasim min ashab al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Al-Tabari says from so and so and so and so, a lot of people that never was a child born to Adam except that a boy born to Adam except that a girl would also be born with that and so the boy of one batch would be married to the girl of the other batch and the girl of one batch would be married to the boy of the other batch this is what is reported from the early uh, 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 Sahaba and Tabi'un and one of the uh, scholars of the past Ibn Allan uh, a scholar of Quran and Hadith and, and he died in the 11th century of the Hijrah he said that in the Sharia of Adam alayhi uh, salam, it is as if different batches of children from the womb of Hawa took the status of distant relatives, like a cousin or a second cousin. So it is as if the brother and sister were the ones in the same womb at the same time. This becomes brother and sister. So the one that's born in a different time frame, they become like a relative and not like a brother or sister, like a cousin. So this is Ibn Allan uh, basically commenting on this. In the end of the day, you know, nothing is known for certain. We, we don't know, but it does appear that that's really the only thing that would have happened or else how do we explain, uh, you know, this, uh, this reality? There is no other way to explain this. And in the end of the day, we firmly believe that uh, the Sharia and laws can change from prophet to prophet. And what was allowed for one prophet might have been forbidden for another. And this is the Quran mentions this very clearly. Uh, the Torah of Musa had very strict laws that Allah lifted from Isa. And our Sharia, many more things are lifted. In contrast to this, some things might have been allowed for the previous Sharia's. For example, there are claims, and Allah knows how true this is, that small amounts of alcohol might have been allowed for some of the previous Sharia's. And Allah has, under, uh, or Allah has shown us that alcohol should be completely haram because it is nothing but evil. So Sharia's can change from time to time and prophet to prophet and exceptional circumstances such as the first generation of mankind warrant exceptional rules. So exceptional circumstances warrant exceptional rules. You don't extrapolate general rules from exceptional circumstances. Therefore, Although we do not know for a fact what happened, it is reasonable to surmise and we have statements of the Sahaba in this regard that a one-off 
for only that generation, they had a different understanding of what it means to be brother and sister. And what else did you expect because they are the first generation? And so it was allowed for them. And even then we can say it was haram for them to marry their sister. But the definition of sister for that generation, as Ibn Allan said, was the one who is born in the same batch. And the one who's born in a different batch, that one is considered like, yani from their sharia, what we would consider a cousin or second cousin, it's considered like that. And so this is how we would understand this reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, we come to the conclusion of today's lecture. Inshallah, we have some other loose ends to tie up uh, about the story of Adam. And then inshallah ta'ala, we have a interesting uh, tangent about the story of Adam, which I don't want to reveal too much about, but we will get there inshallah. And, and then after after that, we will be done with the story of Adam and then move on to uh, the next uh, stories of the prophets. Until next time, Jazakumullahu Khairan, Wassalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. <laughs> ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب